when someone misuses context, maybe it's a news article, maybe it's a journal article, maybe it's a story, maybe it's a document, maybe it's just a paragraph. If someone misses the context of something they're writing about or talking about, is that missing of the context based upon incompetence, dishonesty, or ignorance? And I really don't know that there's a fourth alternative to that. And there are there are instances all around us, and they have been through history, people missing the context of something. In the book titled America's Christian History, The Untold Story, there is an example of missing the context that I'd like to share. Initially, it's a statement that comes out of an article that appeared in Time Magazine, September of 1992, Why the Religious Right is Wrong. But the statement the statement was this. The writer says, John Adams once described the Judeo-Christian tradition as the most bloody religion that ever existed. She doesn't give any source. And I think there is a reason for that. If you actually look up the source because you can find it, it's obvious, obvious that she is misquoting the statement. Here's a statement from which she gets that quote. As I understand the Christian religion, John Adams writes, it was and is a revelation. But how has it happened that millions of fables, tales, legends have been blended with both the Jewish and Christian revelation that have made them the most bloody religion that ever existed? He is defending scripture, bemoaning the fact that people have messed it up. But you wouldn't know that from the quote of this writer. You can look up that article, you can find it in the archives of Time Magazine. And the writer is touted as a very accomplished writer. If that is what it means to be accomplished, maybe it would be better to not be an accomplished writer. The problem the problem in, in taking certain statements and discarding the context is something that abounds within, well, within the school system, for one, but within religion as well. As far as John Adams is concerned, here are a couple of other quotes. These are from two letters that he wrote to, to Thomas Jefferson. This quote comes from a letter dated to June the 28th, 1813. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. A few months later, again to Thomas Jefferson, this letter dates to December the 25th, 1813. I've examined all religions as well as my narrow sphere, my straightened means, and my busy life would allow. And the result is that the Bible is the best book in all the world. It contains more philosophy than all the libraries I have seen. You see the problem? Individuals that have a specific agenda. And the author of that article in Time is listed as a socialist. No wonder. It doesn't seem to bother her at all that she takes things totally out of context. What about the religious world? I want to give one example. We've talked about it before. You find it in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16. And there are a lot of religious groups that focus upon verse 30 and 31. The jailer, the Philippian jailer, after an earthquake, and after he hears Paul and Silas say, we're, we're, all the prisoners are still here. Verse 29, he called for a light, called for something to light his way. He rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Verse 30, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what do you to be saved? Verse 31, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. How many times have you heard over the years religious groups use those two verses without looking at the context? And I want to ask the question, not really why they answered the way that they did, but why did he ask the question the way that he asked it? He asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why did he say it that way? 
And the reason, if you look at it, is very simple to explain. It goes back to the context beginning in verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Sounds a whole lot like the question that the jailer asked later on. This she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But... When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers, and when they brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews. They're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them. The magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. What does the jailer know? Oh, these men are Jews, and they've been disrupting our city. Well, what did they do? There's a girl that kept following them around, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. That's what he knows. That's what he's heard. That's why he asked the question the way that he does. There's an earthquake late at night that rattles the prison enough that the prisoners, if they wished, could have escaped. They didn't. The jailer had been asleep. The earthquake wakes him up. And thinking that all the prisoners have gone, he draws his sword and is about to kill himself. Verse 27. In Roman law, if your prisoner escapes, you stand in his place. And Paul and Silas call out, we're, we're still here. So with that kind of, of event, and with the fact that the prisoners are all still there, and knowing what he had heard when these two were thrown into prison, he falls down and says, what must I do to be saved? The answer to that question does not lie just in verse 31, and actually goes all the way down through verse 34. Verse 34, and we'll go back. Verse 34 says, He, the jailer, brought them up into his house, set food before them, and rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Okay, what did that belief involve? Context. So verse 31, they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. When re religious groups say that all you have to do is have this mental, uh, mental acceptance, just accept Jesus into your heart, that's not what they told him. In fact, in the context of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, from chapter 2 all the way through the end of the book of Acts, you have accounts of people becoming Christians, accounts of conversion to Christianity scattered throughout those chapters. Nobody, nobody was told to pray a prayer and receive Jesus into their heart. Context. So when you misuse context, when you overlook context, is it based upon incompetence, dishonesty, or ignorance? Which of those three the religious world that teaches something totally different than what you find in these stories. They will continue to take a look at conversions. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.